Hello and welcome to a festive episode of Unstratified Entertainment. Uh, today I am joined as ever by my co-host Mr Andy Brockman in uh, the series that's all about entertainment. We like to look at film, TV and other forms of media and examine how it relates to history, both our knowledge of history, a broader context of history, and also as well, how it works as entertainment. It's not just about, I think, uh, being historically accurate. It's about the the, the quality and the, the the spirit of whatever it is that's being made and how, how it sits with us. Uh, that's what this show is about. And today we figured we'd give ourselves a festive treat and move away from controversial topics such as a bypass tunnel being dug in Salisbury Plain <coughs> um, towards something completely uncontroversial, completely un, uh, 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 unlikely to, to get the, the, the blood pumping. And that is the topic of the princes in the tower. <laughs> No, and, and, and as our viewer can see, uh, you, you've got your festive headgear on. I'm proving my uh, credentials as a serious historian and archaeologist. Uh -huh. I've got my uh, my medieval hat, my my my, my 15th century hat, mm -hmm. um, with um, complete with its with a swan's feather, mm -hmm. and um, you see the, um, the 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 Plantagenet leopard there. I'm oh, sorry to yes. show my uh, my allegiance to the to, to the monarchy. Um, I like it. it. It's not. Yep, yep. It's not three lines on the shirt. It's three plants. Plantagenet leopards. Leopards, interesting, mm. interesting. Yeah. That that would be a far less catchy song, though, wouldn't it? It wouldn't scan as well. No, no. three leopard. No, no. Uh, so this this is this is all about uh, Richard the Third, and uh, this is also uh, all about Philippa Langley. Now, people may know that name. Uh, she is the historian who pushed for helped to fund and was very prominent in the 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 uncovering the 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 rediscovery of King Richard III's remains in a car park in Leicester the King in the Car Park documentary actually can also still be found uh, on more 4 on the channel 4 app where i watched this documentary a couple of days ago um and it, it, she's she well it's, it's it, yeah the, the the premise is laid out whereby it was thought that uh, she, she 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 considered job done when Richard the Third was found. We we found him again. We've given him a proper burial. Uh, job done. But actually, she said uh, that the job wasn't done, and there was still the question as to whether or not Richard had actually done or commissioned the deed, the murder of his nephews, a threat to his legitimacy as king uh, in the Tower of London. This is part of national history. It's a historical narrative that, that many people are familiar with. And even when I lived in York, as much as I'm not familiar with that period of history in particular detail, there is a Richard III, or was, I don't know if it's still there post-COVID, uh, Richard III Museum in, in a gatehouse in the city, which was an interesting little visit as well. So people, often when they hear about they hear about this story, they become very passionate, they have strong opinions, and Philippa is certainly possessed of, of passion and opinion. Um, she's a member of the Richard, Richard III Society, uh, and these Ricardians spend a lot of their time... Um, uh, researching the the period and combating what is often described as, to use terminology that that they often deploy, uh, Tudor propaganda. Uh, that is to say, uh, the accepted story of history um, is not seen to them as one that is untouched by the likes of Henry Tudor and Co. So, uh, where where I mean, do we need to know a little bit more about the about the princes in the tower? In order to know what on earth's going on with this documentary, yeah, I, I think if I if I just lay out the, the the basics of the story as it's more generally understood, and it's interesting mm -hmm. you mentioned York there. Mm. Um, Richard's power base was in uh, the north of England and, and and Yorkshire. He had a castle at Middleham in Yorkshire, and in fact, if you go to York Minster, uh, off to one side in one of the but in in a, in a prestigious position, mm. is a rather sad little tomb which is actually of Richard the Third's young son. Right. who died at Midland Castle um, in, I think, 1484, well, when, uh, not long after Richard had become king, mm. um, and was one of the reasons why Richard was so insecure, because his heir, his, his heir the person who would have become king uh, when, when, when he died, had, in, had themselves died first, right. which meant that Richard was a king with no heir at that point, which made it much easier for 
uh, pretenders like Henry Tudor mm. to take a take a take a tilt at the at the throne. Mm. Um, essentially, the story is this: Richard was one of a group of extremely charismatic, highly successful brothers who were the son of the Duke of York, um, who were kicked off the Wars of the Roses. If anybody knows their Shakespeare and Henry the Sixth. Mm -hmm. um, uh, th their father had been ki had uh, been killed as a result of uh, losing a battle in the Wars of the Roses. His elder brother Edward is this big giant of a, a you know blonde hero, charismatic man, uh, had become king, um, was exiled when the Lancastrians uh, made a comeback, beat them, came back, reigned as king, and married a lady called Elizabeth Woodville. Hmm. Uh, bringing the, the so-called Woodville faction to, faction to court. Hmm. Um, Edward died suddenly in 1483, leaving as the new king, he and Elizabeth's son, Edward, who would become automatically under, uh, un, un, under the rules of succession. The moment his father died, he became King Edward V. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, they were out of town at the time uh as cutting to the chase in the early uh, summer of 1483 the young king was being brought to london to be crowned by members of the woodville faction as they're called mm -hmm. and richard for reasons which people still argue about including the richard iii society um who was uh to be named as lord protector while the king reigned in his minority before he became 18, mm. um, was uh, basically staged, for want of a better word, a coup mm. at Stony Stratford in the Midlands. Uh, he met the royal party, arrested the Woodvilles, and took the king into his, quote, protection, and took him to London. Mm. Um, then... As the uh, the preparations for the king's coronation were being made, um, it was suddenly announced that Edward the Fourth had, in fact, um, entered into what was called a pre-contract of marriage, and that meant, under medieval canon law and church uh, and, 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 and English laws of succession, that a pre-contract with Lady Eleanor Butler was a, was effectively counted as a marriage, which meant that his marriage to Elizabeth Woodville was bigamous, and therefore the children were bastards, illegitimate. Right, I see. So mm. now, again, people argue about where that pre-contract, um, how, how genuine that pre-contract was. Mm -hmm. It was certainly very convenient timing, mm. because what happened next was that Richard announced tearfully, sadly, this was the situation oh, and therefore sadly i must that, become yeah, king <laughs> absolutely so tra yeah tra tragically for all concerned Rich richard the coronation uh, the coronation preparations became coronation preparations not for edward v but for, for richard the third mm. um that left richard with the issue of what to do with the boys now ricardians argued they were now no longer any danger mm. they were declared declared illegitimate under law they couldn't come back other people argue, yeah, you could, as the government, as the current UK government is finding, you can change the law one way, but then somebody can always change it back. Mm -hmm. So, and it would only take the Pope to, you know, an appeal to the Pope to say, actually, it was all, all right, and mm -hmm. Edward really is the king. So, the traditional view is that the boys, first of all, Edward, and then his younger brother, Richard, were placed in the Tower of London in the summer of 1483. Contemporary sources, um, sources are really important in this story and really important to Philippa Langley's book and documentary. Mm -hmm. uh, contemporary sources refer to the two boys in what was then the palace of the Tower of London. It wasn't necessarily a prison. It wasn't necessarily somewhere you went to be executed mm -hmm. or to wait to be, or, or to be quietly put away. Mm. Um, it was somewhere where members of the royal family <coughs> lodged when they were in London. Hmm. Um, it just happened to be a place that was more secure than perhaps other other of the, of the, of the palaces. Hmm. Um, 
contemporary sources refer to the boys being seen in the grounds of the tower uh, be, to be playing, shooting uh, bows and arrows. Um, and so, on. but it's then re uh, re recorded that they were seen less and less until they were no longer seen at all. So the contemporary sources effectively say at some point in the late summer, early autumn of 1483, the boys disappeared. Hmm. They were not seen again in any, at least put it this way. Um, the, the, it is not in any way proven, shown, that those two boys showed up anywhere else after the summer of 1483. Right, yes. Um, and in fact, as early as the early, uh, as early 1484, the head of the Etat General, the, the States General in France, the head of the French Parliament, was telling the story of the sad demise of the, king, of the, of the young King of England as a cautionary tale to French nobility and politicians as to what could happen when they had a uh, when you had a king in a minority uh, who, who wasn't legally old enough to rule in their own right because that was a situation France was in at the time as well mm -hmm. so within a few months of them disappearing it was being stated that they'd been killed right now jump forward to August of 1485 Richard is killed at the Battle of Bosworth. Mm. Um, he is famously, as Philippa Langley, uh, uh, the, the, the work partly directed and funded by Philippa Langley, the Richard III Society, showed in 2012, carried out by the Leicester archaeologists and the DNA team under Terry King mm -hmm. and, uh, at the University of Leicester. Um, Richard, who did have a back condition scoliosis mm. but which wouldn't have affected his day-to-day -day life apart from possibly causing him some physical discomfort pain uh, but he could function perfectly well as a medieval warrior and king mm. Mm. but um what his death didn't lead to was a revelation of what had happened to the princes mm. they basically had vanished and there were no bodies now the fact that you know the, the, that famous concept in english law is habeas corpus show us the body mm. And there was no, there were no bodies to share here, and even Henry the Seventh, the new king, the pretender Henry Tudor, um, who would led the rebellion, the successful rebellion, ultimately successful rebellion, did not accuse Richard of the murder of Edward and Richard in his legislation on becoming king. The the closest he got was a reference to child murder. Hmm without naming anybody mm. Mm. and so that and, and that fact that there were no bodies and that Henry made no accusation had led some Ricardians for example to argue that actually he had a greater mot motive for offering the princes than Richard had and if he found them alive when he became king they wouldn't have lasted very long because mm. their claim to the crown was better than his mm. Mm. If they were if they were seen as legitimate, yeah, and of course they represented a they represented a different half of the war. The wars, <clears throat> the Rose. they were the Yorkist for half, half. He was the Lancastrian half. Yeah. Um, it then uh, gets further complicated by the fact that to unite the country, Henry marries the boy's sister. Okay. Uh, to unite the two dynasties, and that's where we get the Tudor Rose from. The white mm. rose and the red rose united although that doesn't come in as iconography until henry the eighth really mm. Mm. she was um she was still elizabeth of york mm. um and the mother of henry the eighth yes um so somebody who has skin in the game uh has uh you know her brothers are the ones that disappeared um she's then presented with two pretenders lambert simnel in 1487 and then through the 1490s a second pretender called Perkin who is known to history as Perkin Warbeck mm. um, claiming both claiming to be the younger boy Richard although some historians now argue that the Lambert Simnel rebellion was actually in the name of and this is covered in the documentary was actually in the name of Edward V and that Edward survived and was actually there was in there in 1487 at the Battle of Stoke Mm. where the rebellion was defeated and may even have been killed at the Battle of Stoke, mm. buried, buried anonymously. Mm. 
after the battle. So that's that's the history that uh, lies behind the documentary. The traditional story really begins in the 15 teens, 1520s, when Sir Thomas More's History of Richard III is, is written and, 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 and later published, which lays down the traditional story, which was then picked up by Shakespeare, that the king, appropriately enough, seated on the privy, particularly sort of disgusting and base way to come up with a disgusting and base action, mm. sends some of his henchmen to the tower to murder the princes. The princes are murdered uh, by smothering in their beds, uh, suffocated. They're then, uh, as Moore describes it, buried under a staircase, 10 feet under a staircase in the Tower of London, in the White Tower. Mm. And uh, uh, although then it's later suggested that they were exhumed and the bodies were removed elsewhere another complication shakespeare picks up the story in the 1590s and writes this fantastic satire on politics and, and, and machiavellian princes called richard the third tragical mm. history of richard the third and that really fixes <clears throat> the idea of the you know the humpback you know the, the distorted in body distorted in mind super villain who is also incredibly articulate and, and compelling mm. Um, and 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 that is, and, and that fixes the, the 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 public view, and the final piece of evidence that's covered uh, you know, uh, that people might be aware of in the um, in the fifteen eighties when Charles II has just become king again, um, there are, is work being done in the Tower of London. Bones are discovered, including two skulls, which appear to be of two children. Uh, now, after there's no chain of evidence, but after a period of time the king ordered the bones collected because they were seen as being likely to be those of the princes and they were placed in a highly decorative marble monument designed by Sir Christopher Wren in Westminster Abbey and they were uh, along with a, a basic outline of the history and they are giving back given their identities as King Edward V and his brother Richard hmm. and um, that monument is still there to be uh, to, to be visited. Um, when you visit, it is in the royal section of Westminster Abbey. It's in a prominent position. It's a position of honour. Um, it was the contents were examined in the 1930s, and we'll maybe come back to that later. Which is something Ricardians make a lot of because mm -hmm. it was it was, a, it was an inconclusive examination, included by somebody who had no medical experience. Mm. Uh, and subsequent requests, particularly after the DNA work that was done that identified Richard III conclusively, um, request to have the, the contents of that monument examined again uh, was certainly refused by the late, king, uh, the late Queen, who apparently said, let them rest in peace. Mm -hmm. Now, it is hoped by some supporters of Richard III that the new king, particularly this interest in history and ar archaeology, um, might relent and allow for uh, a fresh examination and particularly DNA work on those uh, on, on those skeletons. Mm. So that's really where the story stands at the moment, and that's where Philippa Langley picks up the picks up the history. Well, and it's a very tenuous place to be, isn't it? Because if that DNA work is done and it's shown to be the boys, then all of this goes out the window. <laughs> you know, uh, so it's, it's 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 right there on a knife's edge, and so for now, uh, claims can be made and can't be disproven. I suppose uh, adequately. Yes. Now, yes. interestingly, in, at the beginning of the documentary, she she says that um, for her, uh, she feels that the she feels very strongly, quote, very strongly, that the truth matters, and therefore set up the Missing Princes project involving. Um, as described in the, in the documentary, an army of researchers from around the world have been making uh, startling discoveries, uh, mm -hmm. in particular across the European continent. And and that does make sense. You know, as they lay it out in the documentary, it makes perfect sense because uh, you can, might be able to rewrite domestic history and destroy and or modify documentation and future copies of documents uh, within the UK or within England in particular. Uh, but doing that in other kingdoms across the, the, across the continent is much more difficult for the fledgling Tudor uh, dynasty. Um, and to this end, and, and I made a note here, which I found interesting, uh, asking why is it that she goes and finds uh, the TV personality Judge Rinder, who is a, a barrister 
Is he a KC? Rob Rinder KC, absolutely, yeah. 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 He, he's a practising King's Council. Mm -hmm. um, he, uh, uh, amongst other things, he's taken part uh, in um, trials relating to uh, fraud in, uh, in, the, in, in, in Caribbean countries, mm -hmm. uh, alleged fraud in Caribbean countries, and, and so on. So, so, you know, he, he's... Cases, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, he, he, he's, he's got a genuine legal career, um, and he's used to handling evidence and particularly assessing documents mm. well this and just to, just for folks uh, outside the uk he's judge rinder in the same way that you also have judge judy in the us mm. he has that, that that sort of tv role as well uh, far, far far be it from me to say that the only ism television believes in his plagiarism but basically uh, the, the the judge rinder program is a, a, a it, it, it is sort of adjacent to the format of judge judy yes exactly say. Exactly. Yeah. But anyway, so she says that she approaches him because, quote, she needed a criminal forensic mind. Uh, mm -hmm. She also refers to him as a professional skeptic to open this cold case investigation. And the, and the whole documentary, I don't know about the book, but the documentary is certainly framed as a, uh, a reopening of, of a cold case uh, and a, uh, an attempt to, to, to demonstrate to a legal professional uh, beyond reasonable mm -hmm. doubt their case that the boys survived uh, Richard the third and indeed uh, um, continued to push their claim for the throne of of England now um it, it, it's interesting that this, this that everything here if, if seeing as 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 you can't disprove uh, some of these claims until that 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 DNA evidence is examined everything is based upon the documentation that they that they can uncover. And also, as well, the likelihood that that, that documentation is is acceptable. So there are some um, some experts who are brought in to comment on this throughout the documentary. Um, the, uh, and one of the early early experts that's brought in is uh, Yanina Ramirez of uh, Oxford University, yeah. who is an early medieval uh, art specialist. Um, and uh, she dismisses, for example, uh, Thomas More's account and also the account of Mancini, a, an Italian monk uh, priest who was in London at the time and commented on how the boys were seen less and less frequently until eventually they just weren't seen at all. Indeed, yes. uh, She just dismisses them out of hand and goes so far as to say, this is a Catholic nation. You don't kill children. Now... I have, has she studied? I, has she studied Renaissance Italy? That's my point exactly. Yeah, does she know the Bo the, the, yeah, the Borgia? You know, like does she know? Does she does she know anything about the and and I don't I, I don't mean that it, to dismiss her, but no, I, I, she, but no, I, no, she's a, she's a ser she's a serious academic. Yeah, but I am fascinated no. as to how and why it is that she is the academic that they use on this TV show. Uh, she's known for appearing in various documentaries, but she is not a period specialist. Uh, so it, it is interesting, an interesting use of, of her. I mean, what, what do you make of that from a from a production standpoint? I, th I think the production of this is really interesting, mm. um, and, and it's worth also mentioning that um, the, the, the the talking heads in general. Um, an, another talking head is used. You now I've just told the traditional version mm. um, in outline, and the documentary does exactly the same thing. It uses a uh, historian called Nathan Amin. Uh, who's a Welsh uh, specialist in the period. Um, he's about to um, publish a book called The Son of Prophecy about Henry Tudor, mm. Henry VII, mm. um, and, and, and his family origins. Um, he described himself on his ex-Twitter account as a Tudor propagandist, fellow of the Royal Historical Society, author of The House of Beaufort and Henry VII and the Tudor Pretenders. And that's the particular one. Henry VII and the Tudor Pretenders mm. is, uh, he looks at exactly the same, arc story arc as philippa langley does mm. but it means is to um to tell the traditional version and in fact in an interview he described how um during the making of the film he did a couple of takes I I I involving um the narrative in, in, i think it was i think it was actually shot at the tower of london if i'm very correctly mm. um and he tells the traditional version and he tells the story that the director of the program then said, um, look, you know, it was a bit hedged around an academic and the evidence points to the fact that Richard could have da da da. Could you just not say that Richard did it? Yeah. Mm. And he then goes on to say, okay, and he makes another 
piece to camera saying that Richard did it. Mm. And in an interview he's given about this whole subject, he, 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 he talks about that and that moment and how people should understand that television isn't made for historians. It's made for a TV audience. Mm. And that, you know, that, that the historian doesn't have the last word. The TV director and producers do. Mm. And that is absolutely true. I can say, you know, I think I said, I said to you while we were setting this up, I had exactly the same experience when we were making the film about the Burma Spitfires. Mm. And that we'd have situations where I'd do a take and the director would say, yeah, Andy, that was great, but you know, could we do another take? And I need you to say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it takes, you, you, at that point, you have a choice to make. You just say, okay, can I just say that? Is it ethically okay to say that? Or do I have to say, look, I can't say that, but what I could say is, mm. so you're meeting halfway, you're trying to come to a compromise. That's mm. how TV production like this works. Mm. You know, it's not like it's not like a, 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 a peer review paragraph in a journal of record. No. And we've seen how you know, we've seen how flaky that can be. <clears throat> You, know, no. you see what I mean? Yeah. So but, people well, need they, to be aware well, of this, and that this may have gone on in some of this, uh, some of this, uh, some some of the some of the pieces, some some of what you see on screen, you don't see how they were set up. No, this is true. Uh, uh, but but th that said, though, in that sense, it's possibly even worse in terms of representation of history, potentially, than the Lost King was, because this does not have the its fiction defence. You know, uh, uh, lots of the stuff we talked about in our conversation about the Lost King, you know, you you, you were playing the role at times of saying, well, yeah, but it's 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 writing, it's it's a story structure. There's a reason for this. It's what, and, it's what Shakespeare did. Yes, but in this instance, uh, while it is what the documentary crew apparently did, that's not how it's presented. It's not presented as a as a store as a as a fictional story. It's presented as a serious presentation to a serious legal mind on the legality on balance of uh of well, as rinder puts it proof of life for the boys from the tower um and uh, i made a note here that said here that the more the main so-called mainstream and they use the term mainstream history in this documentary versus interested amateur narratives uh persist the more damaging they are in terms of debate and trust mm -hmm. And I would say the reason why that they're potentially more damaging is not because alternate views are unwelcome. Alternate views with evidence can be fascinating, but alternate views presented in uh, what is technically bad faith, i.e., a director putting words into the mouth of an academic. Uh, or, no, 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 no not putting history. words into the mouth of an academic. Asking an academic to state a particular viewpoint because it would be better for the arc of the story the narrative arc of their program because, yeah, yeah exactly because and, yeah, and therefore putting words into his mouth the guy did the take and the director said i don't like that let's change it um so in a very narrow sense suggesting words for the mouth of the historian yeah. involved yeah. um that that doesn't help especially when when it is presented as being a serious documentary in this notion of uh, of what a debate is and what we can trust within those debates surrounding these things yeah. now what one yeah. of the one of the first pieces of evidence that we see in the show is a receipt found in lille in france um yeah. and it's a receipt for 400 pikes uh, written yeah. in 1487 supposedly for the use uh, for use in a yorkist invasion of of england led by an imposter possibly uh, backed by king maximilian of the holy roman empire yeah. now that that's that's the that's the, the tudor propagandists angle but this is this yeah. is a piece of evidence that that the ricardians in or, or La philip langley brings uh rob rinder to uh, as a, yes. as an opening gambit in showing that there was there was at least someone on the continent who believed that there was a surviving heir from the Orchest House that could yes. be backed in invading the country. Um, what do you, uh, what do you make it, uh, make of it? It's written by an accountant, and it also yeah. references Margaret of Burgundy as well. Yes, who was now, one of the sisters of Richard III, I think. That I, um, yes, I, I, I need to uh, th this European act aspect, and you, you alluded to it before, mm. and we can. I think we, this, this is the moment to uh, to 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 be 
clear about this now um and this is something again i'm indebted to my uh, late friend and colleague mike ingram mm. who did a lot of work on this particular aspect of the wars of the roses and the military aspect of the wars of the roses mm. um and what mike was always pointing out was that the english nobility at this time was not insular mm. it had relationships across europe mm -hmm. it it, it did it went on tours it, it it joined crusades it joined you know it it, it served with other people's armies it, uh, it went on pilgrimage yes yeah it went on pilgrimage and so on and, mm -hmm. and in fact margaret duchess of burgundy was a sister of yes of edward the fourth and richard the mm. third and a very important player in european politics in her own right mm. yes and she backed uh, politically and financially both the Lambert Simnel rebellion and the Perkin Warbeck attempted rebellion mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and one of the arguments goes why would she stick her neck out to that degree um, financially politically roping in the Holy Roman uh, the king of the Holy Roman Empire soon to be the Emperor Maximilian may a major figure in late medieval politics mm -hmm. why would she commit all of that time and treasure um for a no hope son of a, a, a lower middle class person from oxford or the son of a, 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 a boat maker from yeah. a, a fisherman a boatman a boatman mm. or some some uh, from, from from what's now belgium mm. yeah um did did you know did she uh, and this has gone into later on in the documentary you know um the, the, allegedly at one of her palaces there was a richard's room mm. Mm. Um, as though it had been named for her nephew. Uh, well, um, and more to the point, named for its occupant. Yes. Yeah. Mm. Yes, mm. being her nephew. Mm. Um, we'll come to that, that maybe, may, maybe later in another one mm. of the, and perhaps the most significant of the documents, or at least the most eye-catching of the documents. In defence of Yanina Ramirez, although it, she, she doesn't need me to defend her, but um, she is quoted again in the publisher's blurb of the book, as saying, quote, rather than favour Tudor propaganda or Victorian revisionism, the princes in the tower asked us to go back to the time and scrutinise the evidence with fresh eyes. And in fact, even some negative reviews of the book that I've read say that Philippa Langley has actually done the study of the period of service mm -hmm. by going back to the period documents and looking at them in a timeline, saying this document was done contemporaneously with the boys disappearing this was done in the first few years after they disappeared when the Lambert Simnel, Lambert Simnel rebellion was being prepared mm. and this material relates to you know the the Perkin Warbeck period down to the late 1490s and then this is written a generation later two generations later it's being reported three generations later etc 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 and that is really valuable. You know, there's, there's, there's that rule of thumb in history is that the closer you get to the event, the more likely your source material, your primary source material is to be valuable. Because the moment it's, it, it's transmitted through time or through third parties, it starts to be diluted. Yes. Yeah. Bits get lost, bits get left out, bits get misunderstood, spellings mm -hmm. change, you know, all that stuff happens that historians understand. Mm -hmm. But yeah, you know, so so if nothing else, what this film does and what Langley has done in the book apparently is to, you know, go back to your sources, guys. Mm. Yeah. And, which, and, and, and and sorry, go. Well, which, which which is which is excellent, uh, and uh, and again, it should be clear. Uh, hopefully, in our previous um, discussion about Philip Langley's work, that uh, that she does do great work uh, she just do solid work she's not she's not she's not an unserious historian uh and um uh it's it, it's 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 the stuff around it that that sometimes can rub archaeologists and historians the, the, uh, slightly the wrong way uh, and, 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 and it's worth making the point as well that um people who have endorsed various conspiracy theories hmm that stretch the evidence further and further and further who are associated with the ricardian cause and the richard iii society and so on mm -hmm. um which they don't go into in this documentary but that th they are there and they do in a sense give the study of the period a bad name and make people maybe less likely to comment on it than they might do otherwise if they're coming from a, a purely academic point of view and maybe that's why an, an early medieval art historian is one of the academics that they could get onto the top this documentary uh in so much as Yanina, Yanina Ramirez is unlikely to 
lose too much face over stating an opinion on these documents as opposed to presenting it as her research or something something along those lines uh, 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 absolutely and also you know nathan amin you know he, he has his particular place in that particular mm. uh you know that that particular field he he's respected his books are respected and you know that he as i say he, he's not coming from a purely academic point of view but you know he's a professional writer no but he mm. you know he's writing solid work um other uh, the other people who appear in the uh, one of the other people who appear on the uh, in the documentary Matthew Lewis uh, <clears throat> is associated you know, with that I think he's the current chair of the Richard the Third Society, mm. um, but he you know he's the, he's written a book which is about to go into a new edition in fact called the Survival of the Princes in the Tower. Right. Uh, I think it went to press before uh, Philippa Langley's, but they, they 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 follow broadly speaking the same trajectory in terms of wanting to. Um, bring fresh eyes to Richard and maybe to rehabilitate his reputation. Well, and, and, um, and I suppose one final note on that is that that's not typically how historians work, though. That's the other thing that, that possibly bothers some historians is that you don't typically set out to rehabilitate anyone. You set yeah. out to examine what documents say. And yes. the funny thing is that is exactly what they are doing. They are doing that. Yeah. It's just that they're doing that with a slight a, a priori um suggestion that perhaps the documents will say what they hope they will say yeah um, now the, the, getting back just very 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 quickly to the leal receipt mm -hmm. um that that says to, to somebody anybody who knows the period that says a number of things obviously prima facie it says that um a continental power was engaged in supporting a potential insurrection by somebody who was claiming to be the rightful king of england at that moment Mm. And they were supporting them militarily. Mm -hmm. the, the reference to pikes is interesting because the kind of what, what Mike would have said is that the use of pikemen, uh, the, the assigning a pikeman to that kind of that kind of operation mm -hmm. at that time shows that this was cutting edge military technology. This was the the technology that had been used famously by the Swiss to beat the Burgundians, mm. the Burgundian cavalry. The pike was the new weapon of choice if your enemy re relied on heavy cavalry. Yes. Because you could keep them, you know, a, 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 a long pike with a sharp pointy bit on the end could keep your knight at distance mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Where, uh, where you could then get him off his horse, uh, kill his horse, get him on the ground, as happened with Richard at Bosworth. Mm. Yes, exactly. You know, so, th you know, th this, this is a major european power using state-of-the-art military technology to back a rebellion of an english uh, against the english king yeah now lambert simnel uh, be he uh, a real person uh, or or not or uh, edward or not uh went on to be crowned it seems in dublin yeah. and it's interesting that uh, a statement is made nobody would want to do that for someone called lambert simnel a 10 10 year old boy from oxford Except, I think they possibly would. Again, if if we're talking about, and, and to be fair, Rinda in the documentary does point this out. There are reasons why some of these some people would either want to try and pull off a um, uh, a forgery, I suppose, a human forgery, or yeah. would want to believe strongly, you know, with all their hearts, believe that these boys didn't. Uh, didn't perish that they were still around well don't don't forget the doppelganger is a trope in fiction as well i mean yeah. I, I'm, I'm thinking immediately of you know mark twain's famous story that's been filmed many times the prince and the pauper yeah the i the idea of the lot uh, the, the, the the lost you know, aristocrat the lost king or whatever who mm. who suddenly comes back and um and, and, and is acclaimed it, it it's a trope across history yeah no, so, exactly. and, exactly. It's, and it's and it, 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 it fulfills all sorts of cultural and political mm um uh, uh, needs among mm. audiences now this by this but this, this bias continues from the ricardian perspective uh, there are some other potential explanations for who this lambert simnel character was he may have been another yorkist uh, edward and that is edward earl of warwick uh, and not edward the uh, the fifth of uh, of the tower um uh, but regardless, whoever this Edward character was, or this Lambert Sibnall character was, he died at the Battle of Stoke in 1487. And the Ricardian bias, I think, comes into this when uh, he says, and I think he answers his, his own question 
here within within his statement. If you're a mercenary, would you follow a random boy called Lambert Simnel? Well, if you're a mercenary, you follow anyone who's got money. <laughs> like, you know, like that's the, I think that, that, that itself is, it's a self-feeding potential bias there. It's presuming that, oh no, they're only going to follow a true well, heir to the crown. I, well, just, just a couple of things just quickly there. First mm. of all, Lambert Simnel as the Earl of Warwick is one of those fringe conspiracy theories because mm. the Earl of Warwick was actually um, in prison, for want of a better word, in the tower by mm. Henry VII. Mm. And in fact, effectively never left the town and was executed at the same time as Perkin Warbeck. Right, right. Um, because they, uh, 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 it, it, it was alleged they attempted to escape together. They were, uh, they were both caught, they were both tried, and they were both executed. Mm. Interestingly, Warbeck was hanged as a commoner, whereas the Earl of Warwick was beheaded as an aristocrat. Mm. Mm. Um, it, it, his is actually one of the saddest stories in the whole thing, and it's often overlooked. But there's very little doubt that he was actually in the tower at the time. So the idea that it, it was the Earl of Warwick, yes, they might have said that to people in Dublin because, you you know, you people in Dublin weren't in London and commu communications being what they were at the time. It was but there was, it was very hard to prove the otherwise. Prove mm. otherwise. Mm. Um, the other thing about the Battle of Stoke, um, Lambert Simnel traditionally was captured at the Battle of Stoke, and to humiliate him, to show he was a common. Uh, you know, a commoner and had no connection with the royal family. Henry famously put him to work in the royal kitchens as mm. a scullery boy. Mm. Um, in terms of the people who were actually calling the shots at the Battle of Stoke, the mercenaries who were involved were led by a mercenary captain called Martin Schwartz. And um, they gave their money's worth because they were some of the last people left standing on the battlefield. And in fact, pretty much all of them were killed. Mm. Mm. Um, they were they were professional to the last. Yeah. So that's what's going on here. Yeah, yeah. And and so I should say the story of Edward dies on that field. Um and this this character, Lambert Simnel, is is fully born into this notion of especially be, being yeah, being a magnanimously forgiven for rebellion and uh, put to work in the kitchens. Yeah. Yes. Um now, what follows in terms of documentation, following on from this receipt in Lille, is a, a first-person document, supposedly, found in an archive, uh, the Gelders Archive, in uh, Amham, in the Netherlands. Um, it's an interesting one. It's a document that, that reads like a first-person statement, as Rinder himself says, it reads like a witness statement. This happened yes. to me, I saw this, this, this happened yes. next. Um, but it's of, of extremely unknown provenance. In fact, it's even in the archives' uh, loose acquisitions collection, so they don't know where it came from or when. Yes. Um, and uh, it, it, although it seems to be from the correct dates, 1450 to 1500, they almost sort of brush over this in the documentary, uh, that actually this document was previously discovered. Uh, a piece of additional dialogue, I think, was recorded, uh, explaining that actually this this document had initially been found in the mid twentieth century, the fifties or sixties or thereabouts, and uh, and that it had been essentially dismissed back then as as not a reliable document. Um, what do you make of it? Because Rinder calls it a a potential smoking gun of a document and that's one of the key key parts of this documentary going on is whether or not we can rely on this first person statement um supposedly uh, written by uh, by uh, richard the younger uh, about how he was separated from his brother in the tower uh, the percy brothers uh, aristocracy came to him and swore to protect him and then took him abroad and then he was he was taken around the, the continent and eventually was even um linked with an invasion fleet uh it's it's an interesting document that says as a, and to be fair as uh yanina ramirez says later on in the documentary says almost everything that you would want it to say and indeed even skips to the most pertinent points in the story uh, as to how you'd want it to be presented, as to what on earth happened to this boy if you didn't die in the tower, yeah. um, what what do you make of it? Uh, given that it that it's not if this isn't new evidence in that sense, it's just being freshly interrogated. Well, this is the, the this is to say it, it, it's their highlight um, discovery. Yeah, um, it's it, it's uh, and and credit the. Um, uh, the Dutch uh, 
historian who found it in mm. or at least re refound it mm. in the Dutch archive, the Gelderland archive. Um, it's uh, Natalie Newman Bliekendal. And I, my apologies if I've got her pronunciation wrong there. Um, but it's described as a four page semi legal manuscript, a witness statement. Mm -hmm. And yes, that's what it is. Now, the film makers to their credit again they did forensic work on the pet on, on, on the parchment it's written on and the um the literary style and so on it all stacks up for the second half of the uh, 15th century mm -hmm. it, when it exactly when it's purported to have been written mm. now at the same time you know i have to point out that other contentious documents have passed forensic tests in the past um, and then been found subsequently to be forgeries. And I'm mm. thinking of things like the, uh, the, the famous Vinland map. Mm. Yes. Um, yeah. You know, so uh, you still, you, you have to be careful at the same time, The on balance at the moment, it's a genuine document. Mm. Mm. Rinder says it's proof of life. Yes, it is proof of life. It's proof of life of somebody called Richard of England. Yes, it's proof of life of somebody called Richard of England. What it isn't proof of life was, of is that that Richard of England is the Prince Richard who was imprisoned in the Tower of London and disappeared in the late or, late summer, early autumn of 1483. Hmm. So it is a smoking gun document. As you say, it is a proof of life of someone. Someone had to write this thing, clearly. Hmm. Uh, it's not conclusive proof, though. And... Uh, and therefore has to be weighed in, in balance with everything else that, that, that is being presented and also that we know about about uh, about the period. I mean, do you, do you think it just reads as, as too good to be true? Because it's an extraordinary, it's an extraordinary statement. But then again, I suppose this arguably was was a royal heir in extraordinary situ in an extraordinary situation. And therefore the statement could, may well have been necessary for, for quasi legal That's purposes, as they say. That's mm. the point. Mm. That's the point. Mm. I think, you know, uh, I mean, my, my biggest problem with the whole documentary is, and again, understanding how documentaries are made and the fact that this one is an authored documentary, if you like, um, it's telling the story through Philippa Langley's research with her research team. Mm. Um, it's, uh, it, it's still, um, it's sceptical, it sets out to be sceptical, but not sceptical enough. For example, it doesn't pose the question like, uh, what, you know, Rinder is allowed to get away or, or maybe was prompted to say or agreed to say, you know, we don't know. But, you know, he, t he talks about it as a proof of life and it's taken as a proof of life of of Richard, now Richard IV, mm. uh, mm. if his brother is indeed dead by this point. Mm. Mm. Um, and it's not. Well, yeah. it's, not, it's not because it not it's not by very by by most standards, I would suggest. Because, mm. for example, proof of life today is classically someone holding up a newspaper from yes. from, from that morning in a photograph. Yes. You can see who they are, yeah. etc. In this instance, obviously, a photograph wouldn't be possible, but you'd have to have a sample of handwriting or some other thing that connects the boy that went into the tower with this document and this statement, which has been written uh, many years later. Uh, so it's 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 compelling. It's pointing in a direction, but it's not conclusive, is it? In that sense, no. No, and uh, look, I mean, again, we don't want to have too many spoilers. Uh, going to in, in, perhaps into in, into uh, even more detail on what's actually said in the doc. Mm. Um, but I, mean, I think it's fair to say that first of all, all the evidence pretty much is treated in this way genuine evidence and even genuinely new evidence like that legal receipt mm, mm. is pointed up but then it's taken as only being representative of the case that philippa langley wants to make well okay and and, 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 and or at least the documentary makers through philippa langley want to make yeah and, and, however that however that relationship worked out when the program was being developed okay and, and okay given that Okay, we, we 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 won't say any other specifics. Then maybe we will leave the third document out of it, uh, out of our video. But what is worthwhile saying, though, is this this there's this presentational bias of uh, the extent to which the evidence is unusual. So so this third yeah. document has a seal attached to it that Philippa gets very excited about. Yeah. And she says, uh, "You just don't expect that stuff to survive," you know. She says to to render over breakfast. 
uh, or to, you just don't expect to find that sort of thing, I think she says. Um, except you do. When you're studying medieval documents, especially official documents, mayoral documents, town yeah. town uh, corporations, and, and especially royalty, they are laden with seals. And the seals are designed to survive because they are proof that the document is legitimate. So, yes. again, the presentation of some of this stuff is 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 uh, bigging up. It is emphasizing its singular uh, importance and the direction of travel towards uh, a conclusion. And to what extent do you want to talk about the conclusion of this documentary? Because I think I think I'd like to talk about the the way it was filmed. If not, what was said? Right. Um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll leave you to go into the details. But basically, mm -hmm. it was a classic. Um, it, it, it was a classic setup reveal in a in, mm. a, in a room. Mm. Um, and look, the whole thing is. Uh, and, and, and again, I'm not going to criticise them for the format of the film. It's, it, it, it's a police procedural. Uh, one of the most successful formats in the entire history of television. It's repeated and repeated and repeated because mm -hmm. it works, because mm -hmm. audiences love it. Time Team was a police procedural, as mm -hmm. I've said many times. Mm -hmm. it, you know, it, it just happened to be about archaeologists rather than police officers and forensics. Mm -hmm. And yeah, there, there are uh, one other point I think I'd make before we wind up, and that is there are storylines which in some respects support the thesis which they don't go into because it's not based on these documents right one of those one of the most interesting of those is the character of perkin warbeck mm. who again claimed to be richard duke of york richard the fourth who traveled around the courts of europe in the 1490s uh, supported by the D margaret duchess of burgundy um he went to scotland to vi um, uh, visit the scottish court was uh, actually um, and was actually married to a very senior Scottish noblewoman mm. called Lady Catherine Gordon, mm. Mm. and their story actually became the subject of a play by a younger contemporary of Shakespeare's called John Ford. Right, um, and it's sort of ambiguous about his character. He's it 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 plays the political game of um, the character of Henry the Seventh talks about you know that this is a pretender and all the rest of it uh, and, and, and the dead princes, but the character of Perkin Warbeck is a noble one, mm. and the the relationship with Catherine is a genuine love story. Mm. Um, she has one of the finest speeches in Jacobean theatre. Um, you know, so culturally, you know, this this stuff is going on, and there, you know, there's always that thing nagging at the back of mind. You can't prove. Perkin Warbeck wasn't Richard of York, Richard the Fourth. No, and and I suppose one thing that they do point out in the documentary is it's interesting that in Warbeck's treatment while in prison, he wasn't mm. forced to separate from this Scottish noblewoman. Mm. His his marriage wasn't annulled, and seemingly she yeah. didn't she didn't protest it. So yeah. that that's another weird little thing. And that, and, and, that... and in fact, in 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 real life. Um, when he after he was executed, she became a lady in waiting to Elizabeth of York, Henry the Seventh's wife right. and Richard's sister. Yeah, so she was one of the family. Yes. Yeah. Interesting. You know, so again, there's these, there are these little interesting little things, and 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 uh, you know, I'm I'm very intrigued by the whole story, and and I was very open to to whatever conclusion might come. I think, as ever, though, what what sometimes sometimes slightly sours things for me is the need to present uh present things as being more conclusive than they might be yeah. uh, to be fair this documentary does end on a you make up your mind now kind of note uh probably for for uh, you know for, to cover its bases in terms of any potential future discoveries or maybe even legal challenges who knows um <laughs> But uh, and Rinder himself would have been very aware of, of potential legal stuff as well in that sense. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think it does a good job of presenting the balance. Um, uh, but I suppose one final word on Philippa, and this is this is something that, that I think archaeologists and historians are always going to be curious about, is how do you think she comes across in the documentary? Uh, shall I answer that for my for my point? My you answer that for yourself, yeah, yeah. and then yeah. I, I've got my own thoughts on that, which I'll share in a moment. If you okay. Like. Well, this feeds into this. This my, my observations about the finale. Actually, or this comes from those observations. 
uh, it's filmed in a very claustrophobic way. It's kind of, you know, almost chin and forehead cut out, cut off, cut off um, on the mm. frame, both Langley and Rinder in a conference room, presumably in his, his, uh, legal, chambers, his yeah. cha legal chambers. And um, he's going through his notes. Uh, he presents it in that slightly game showy way, you know, and the answer is, and there's like a protracted edited, presumably edited silence. And then, then he suggests what he thinks uh about especially certain points of authenticity etc cetera, etc cetera. now she 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 goes to a coffee shop she comes to the to the to the the legal chambers and then she whispers to herself like okay you know here we go that kind of thing she had she she's she's so passionate and so caught up in 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 this question as to whether or not the boy survived that i would say that she still comes across as as very close to the topic shall we say and th and this yes. is kind of what i was getting at when we talked about the lost king movie you could describe mm. it as passionate you could as nicholas cage says in national treasure what's st one step short of crazy passionate yeah. you know in that sense this 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 notion of the relationship between passion and and almost inappropriate fervor can be dangerously close uh, and i think she's probably mellowed over the years she, she seems to be a little less personally invested in richard maybe that's because she did do do that discovery and then you know job was done on in the first count but i still feel as though it doesn't do her case any favors as a as a as an objective present presentation and that she is clearly so invested in demonstrating that her richard her king richard the third you know uh, her good guy was a good guy in every aspect of his life uh, or every key aspect of his life i should say uh and therefore i think it falls flat at that hurdle um but then again what can you do about that you know she can't well she could have got someone else to present her findings but that wouldn't be as compelling people want to hear from the woman who as rinder says potentially is someone for whom lightning strikes twice so i i get it but also I feel as though sometimes she is her own worst enemy when it comes to to the presentation of, of historical facts. I also find myself wondering, on one last point, how the rest of the Ricardian community views her because she she is presented, especially within the, UK, within the UK, as being the head of many researchers, you know, your army of researchers, your team, so on and so forth. So... Uh, I'm curious about that stuff. I, I have no conclusions because I don't know the woman personally and I haven't looked into their community personally. But it does lead me to wonder uh, whether at times her passion undermines her case. I don't know. What, 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 what do you think? Um, well, I, I go back to the fact that it's it's an authored documentary, at least it's it, it's seen through the eyes of Philippa Langley, Philippa Langley's quest and Philip mm. and Langley's quest to prove. Mm. Um, what I will say about the documentary is that they spent some money on it. Mm -hmm. It's an hour and a half. Mm -hmm. um, it, there's a lot of a lot of good location filming, drone, mm -hmm. you know, some really nice drone footage of medieval palaces in the in the Netherlands and things. And like that. And of course, that. these days, being a roving film crew comes with expense as well in Europe. You can't just uh, cross borders. Yeah, you know, yeah. The, 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 it, it was a serious commitment to making mm -hmm. a a, a lamb. It, it, you know, in in in, in just in, in scheduling terms, it, it was a landmark. You know, it, it was it was a documentary made for prime time and sale abroad, mm. particularly to the states. Mm. And they put the money on the screen. There's also, uh, I, I, mean, I don't know what you feel, but I, I thought that there's some very nice linking uh, animations when they're telling the historical story at the beginning of the. Yeah, uh, well, actually, I, I I specifically this morning um, filmed the screen uh, to demonstrate this and they'll be on screen now while, while we're talking about it. The, the animation style yeah. that they used, I thought was excellent. It was like a sketch, yes. uh, with little splashes of color. Uh, yes. and in that sense, I think it communicated, uh, a sense of telling of storytelling of, mm. uh, of presenting potential counterfactual potential history in yeah. a way that was quite light touch. You know, they didn't, they didn't get lookalikes to act out this stuff you know, in terms of actors, they decided to no. present it as sketches on parchment. And I thought that was quite clever, actually. Mm. Death by cheap reenactment, I call that. Well, death um, by cheap reenactment. But also, I think I think uh, you could argue that could be cheaper 
than you know hiring a room and getting some actors it could be cheaper than actually hiring animators to do all that work oh no that's, that's think, the point I i'm think, making you know the, yeah, yeah, the, the yeah. fact they went for the animation shows you know it was a classy product but they put some they put yeah. money on the screen well and, and i and, and i think i think the in, arguably the intent behind it is to show that these are ideas that people are exploring mm. as opposed to it being you know this definitely yeah. happened you know regardless of what what philippa or anyone else in the, in the documentary yeah. says yeah Mm. Absolutely. Look, I, I mean, in the in the end, I'm I'm not going to take a position on the on the princes in the tower. It, it, it's not my field. It's a fabulous mystery. It's mm -hmm. why films like this still get made, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because you know, unless and until that urn in the in Westminster Abbey gets opened and the DNA work is done, mm. or the two mysterious bodies that are in the the Edward the Fourth's vault in the uh, chapel at Royal Chapel at Windsor mm. um, are. You know, properly investigated rather than just assumptions are made about them. So, you know, there, there, there is there is potential more uh, physical anthropological evidence out mm. there. Mm. Um, yeah. But as you said, as you said quite rightly at, at the get go, uh, and until that work's done and those bones are shown to be genetically related both to each other and to Richard the mm Third, -hmm. arguments like this can, are, are still wide open. Mm. Mm. And um, you know, uh, it, it's uh and you know long may it be so again who who a lot of it has been made of the sort of citizen historians aspect of this yes yeah, citizen historians okay you know say actually historians out in communities who got the time and the commitment to go and look in these archives and find these documents or refine mm -hmm. these documents mm -hmm. and they're doing that and they are doing the subject a service mm. well, and yeah, the and, conclusions and... can be made by other the conclusions that are made by other people aren't aren't their fault no, no, and and it's clear as well that that that, that for example the the Dutch historian, um, or the, so the Dutch archivist, no, sorry, mm -hmm. the Dutch researcher who went into the archive, there was a Dutch archivist mm -hmm. there as well. I'm not talking about her. The researcher was a uh, was a lawyer as well. These are yes. serious people yeah. doing doing what they consider to be serious work. So, yeah. yeah, yeah, you've got to take that that at face value. You absolutely have. Um, also, as well, I suppose one, one, I guess, my final word on the whole thing would be uh, this is yet another opportunity for archaeologists to learn about public communication. Yes. Um, you know, as much as we know there's lots of furore around Langley, the Lost King movie in particular, there's still an academic, I believe, uh, at Leicester who, no, sorry, a, a member of the admin team at Leicester who's threatening to sue the, the production company over his representation in the movie. Um, these things are compelling and do get watched to the extent that they do. Because after all, as we've pointed out previously, the Lost King isn't isn't the Avengers. Not everyone's going to watch the thing, but they are watched and they are and they're presented in the way that they are because those formats do work. And people actually sit down, plant themselves on their sofa, and keep eyes on for, in this case, close to an hour and a half, uh, because the format works. And so uh, you know you, you can you can have your questions about popular presentation of the past. You can have your questions about amateur hist history. Uh, but I think as Sam uh, Stein said in an interview that we filmed roughly this time last year, actually, um, if you want to be involved in these me this messaging and, and how these messages are, are, are crafted, then you need to get involved in the production and uh, not necessarily in the in the aftermath. Uh, because as you pointed out earlier in this in this uh, recording, um, they're not looking for peer review, folks. They're, you know, it's uh, it's done and dusted, and, and now it's up to the public to watch and to see what they think. Yeah, and and, and yeah, and, and just to, to to make the final point, you know, the, the the documentary. I think you know, whatever position you take, and you know, it, it's a well made piece of TV. It's a, a you you. It's not one of those things you reg you you regret. You know, spending half, an hour and a half of your time on it looks mm. it looks good yeah there, there are times you might end up shouting at the screen and wanting to throw things at the screen but at the same time you've been engaged by it mm. even if it's provoked you yeah and so like all worth watching just on those yeah ab absolutely mm. and um just my, my final point uh, i'm looking at the revealing richard uh website at the moment which uh, talks about the um uh, which we'll link to, and it, it talks about the program and the evidence it discusses in, in detail. But I would just point out that um, f in, in it, they quote Philippa Langley as promising a phase two of the Missing Princes project, which is mm. this current iteration. And um, she promises a, a phase two, which includes looking for the, rest the actual resting places of Edward V 
and Richard, Duke of York, possibly Richard the Fourth, wherever they might be. Intriguing. Okay. Watch this space, I guess. Um, speaking of watching, thank you guys for watching at home. Hopefully you've had a good time uh, and hopefully you've had a good year. This will probably be published at some point twixt, uh, betwixtmas, as it's called, the Twixmas. So after Christmas Day, before the new year. I hope that you're having a very merry time. I think both of us plan on having a relaxing time. Uh, mm -hmm. As we record, in fact, uh, Mrs. Soup and a friend of ours are doing the, the food shop for, for, for Christmas uh, Day. And I'm going to do some final editing on a reading of Mabinogi, the Mabinogi, or part of the Mabinogi, uh, to publish over the weekend. So we're winding up for Christmas. Uh, Merry Christmas to you, Andy. Happy holidays, or whatever other... Soul Merry festival. Christmas to everybody else. Yeah, yeah, indeed, well. my lord. Um, I, I, I've got the headphones we, on. I can't, yeah. I can't just pull off the hat. Um, but yeah, ha just have a great time, guys, and um, we'll see you soon. Uh, not least for questionable archaeology. Uh, that's still uh, in the works. Uh, we get to tie down the date, but at some point, hopefully before New Year, possibly just after, we'll see. Um, please do get your questions in. Details you can find on previous videos on this channel. And also, I'll put some details in the description below. Uh, anyway, until then, take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.